Welcome everybody um, to this week's edition of Saint of the Week. I'm Deborah Tomlinson, president of Inside the Vatican Pilgrimages. And I, along with Father Tony Figueredo, who is with us in Rome, excuse me, London, and Dr. Robert Moynihan, who is in Virginia, in the Inside the Vatican Virginia offices. Um, I welcome everybody and hope that you have enjoyed our presentations of the virtual pilgrimages. If you have been unable to attend live, then you can always go to our YouTube channel where you can see each virtual pilgrimage. And today we're most excited. We have Thomas Moore, who um, for many of the people who are on pilgrimage with us today, I see some of our former pilgrims who did travel to England with us for a pilgrimage on St. Thomas More. And uh, we were scheduled to be there this summer, but could not, of course, because of the pandemic. We have had the honor and privilege of on his feast day, celebrating mass in the tower cell of Thomas More, and you will see some of those photos. So I um, turn it over to Father Tony. We will, afterwards, we will have, uh, depending how long the actual spiritual reflection on Thomas More goes, we will have time afterwards, whether 20, 30 minutes, to have open conversation. So, Father Tony. Thank you, Deb, and greetings to everyone here from London itself. It's actually the day of conscience today. Pope Francis mentioned that in his Wednesday general audience. So I think it's just a fantastic day to be speaking about St. Thomas More. Allow me to begin with one of my favorite prayers of another great saint of England, St. John Fisher, who was also martyred just two weeks before Thomas More. We'll be speaking a little bit about John Fisher as well, because these two saints really go hand in hand. Strong and mighty pillars that may suffer and endure great labors, which also shall not fear persecution, neither death, but always suffer with goodwill, slander, shame, and all kinds of torments for the glory and praise of thy holy name. By this manner, good Lord, the truth of thy gospel shall be preached throughout the world. Therefore, merciful Lord, exercise thy mercy. Show it, indeed, upon thy church. Amen. Next Monday, June the 22nd, the church celebrates the memorial of two great English saints and martyrs whose lives have great relevance to the concrete situation that we are living in today. St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More. In a little while we will see a portrait of Thomas More. We see traveling here from the United States across the ocean there to England and to London itself. On this map, you see Chelsea, which is where Thomas More's house is. It's now the major seminary here in the heart of London. I see a number of us are from London here today, so we're very close to this very spot. And on this map, we also have the Tower of London, of course, that's where Thomas More would end his life, and Hampton Court, where Thomas Wolsey and then Thomas More also would work and live for a period of their time. And, and there is Thomas, a portrait. Your father, I, I believe Thomas, he was born right in the heart of London on Milk Street, which is in the middle of the business right. district now. Exactly. We're going to see that shortly. Um, I wanted to capture, Deb, that portrait of Thomas More. I don't know if you have it, because it really sums up 
much of what uh, I wanted to say about Thomas More. It was painted by a German, this, yeah, exactly this portrait, thanks Deb. This was painted by uh, Hans Holbein in 1527, literally Thomas More was seated and he allowed himself to be painted by Hans Holbein. And if you look at this image, it's really quite impressive. The head and torso of Thomas More filled the frame. You know, very often we have some sort of context or landscape or a backdrop behind us. But here, what matters is this man, Thomas More, his mind, the velvet of his robe shimmering, that weighty gold chain of office resting on his shoulders. You see it there, the detailed rose badge hanging from the chain of the House of Tudor lying on his chest. They tell us something important about Thomas More. Yes, he serves the king. That was his job. He was appointed to that. As he would describe himself in his last words, he is the king's good servant. If you notice as well, Thomas More is wearing a ring. He's married, he has children. He dons a cap. It's cold in England and there's stubble around his chin, a little bit like some of us after the lockdown, I think. He's tired from oh, 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 simply doesn't have time to shave. And in his hand, a slip of paper. He had such great influence that very often he would be approached with bribes. He is watchful, if you look, he's watchful. But all the while his brain is moving, it's rotating. In a word, this man, Thomas More, his personality has force. So who was Thomas More? The greatest, the most accomplished Englishman of his generation who could not save his own head. As Deb just told us, he was born in Milk Street in London, very much in the heart of today's financial district and also law district, not far from many of the great uh, law institutions in the city of London. Prior to becoming a priest, I worked in the city of London. I was a stockbroker and so I worked very close to exactly where you see this image now of the birthplace of Thomas More. He was born in 1478, as you see here, the 7th of February. He was a son of Sir John More, a prominent judge. He was educated in London and as a young boy really served as a page in the household of Archbishop Morton, himself a powerful personage. He was the Lord Chancellor. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And that powerful man, Archbishop Morton, prophesied that More one day would become a marvelous man. More went on to study at Oxford. There he wrote comedies. He studied Greek and Latin literature. He returned to London around the year 1494 to study law and was admitted to Lincoln's Inn. For those of us familiar with London, we would know that Lincoln's Inn represents one of the world's most prestigious professional bodies of judges and lawyers. And so it is that Thomas More would go on to become a barrister. But Interestingly enough, he was torn, even whilst he was going through this process, he was torn between a monastic calling and a life of civil service. And he was so torn that whilst at Lincoln's Inn, remember that's a centre for barristers, for lawyers, he subjected himself to the discipline of the Carthusians. He actually lived at a nearby monastery, he took part 
in the monastic life. He prayed, he fasted, he did harsh penances, which stayed with him for much of his life. But his desire for monasticism was finally overcome by the sense, his sense of duty to serve his country in the field of politics. He entered Parliament in 1504 and married for the first time around the same time. He gained a reputation for being impartial and a patron to the poor. His first wife died in childbirth and as you see in this image, a beautiful image really, Moore married again to Dame Alice. You see Dame Alice in this picture together with her daughter, Margaret Roper, with whom Thomas More was particularly close. If those of us who have read A Man for All Seasons, the book, the play, seen the play, we know that there are some wonderful dialogues which take place between Thomas More, Meg, his daughter, and his wife, Alice. But during those years, More becomes more and more attracted to the attention of King Henry VIII. Because of his ability, More's ability, to clear disputes. He was knighted by the king in 1521. Ironically, together with John Fisher, Bishop John Fisher, he helped Henry VIII to write his defense of the seven sacraments, a repudiation of Luther. So all the while, Thomas More's fame is growing in favor in the eyes of King Henry VIII. And Henry VIII will make him the Speaker of the House of Commons, a very prestigious position. But most famously, there then time comes a time when More will enter into conflict with Henry VIII, with his plans, as we well know, to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Nevertheless, after the fall of Thomas Wolsey, then Cardinal and Chancellor in 1521, Moore becomes the Lord Chancellor, the first layman yet to hold the post. So even though he's opposing the King, King Henry VIII, Henry VIII really wants to get him onto his side, giving him this prestigious position of Lord Chancellor. His work continues to be exemplary, but his fall comes quickly. He resigns from being Lord Chancellor in 1532, citing ill health, but the real reason was his disapproval with Henry's stance toward the church. Thomas More refuses to accept the coronation of Anne Boleyn, a matter which does not escape the king's notice, and ten months later, More refuses to swear to the act of succession and the oath of supremacy, making Henry VIII the self-appointed head of the church in England. And so it is that for his silence or lack of explicit support for Henry VIII, Moore is brought to court. And as we see here in Westminster Hall, exactly in this image, he is condemned to death by beheading. In this hall, Sir Thomas More, Lord Chancellor of England, Speaker of the House of Commons, was condemned to death. This is the hall, Westminster Hall, a very prestigious, famous hall in the, within the Houses of Parliament here in London. So it is that after he is condemned to death on July the 1st, 1535, Thomas More is then sent to the Tower of London. He is imprisoned in, you see there, the Tower of London on the banks of the River Thames here. He is there in a small cell in, in the, uh, as you see here, he's literally outside the Tower of London. You can see there the walls in this beautiful image and probably He's meeting here his daughter Meg after he's being sentenced to death. And remember, all along his daughter and his 
wife Alice are really trying to convince him to uh, to to really give in to the king but he stands firm Thomas More stands firm he had a great sense of humor as well he's consoling his daughter he's consoling his wife all along with some great humor but eventually he's remember he's taken to the Tower of London July the 1st 1535 in this small cell as you can see now in these images it's wonderful because on the pilgrimages uh, which, which Bob and Deb run, it's possible to enter this small cell and actually celebrate Mass in the very cell where Thomas More spent his very last days. And what a, really, it just brings uh, shivers to me to be able to do that. But here in this cell, Thomas More spends his days and eventually he's led out. He's led out of that small cell on July the 6th, 1535, and he is beheaded. He is beheaded. His last words on the scaffold. I am the king's good servant, but God's first. Mm. Thomas More was beatified in 1886, canonized by... Catholic Church as a saint by Pope Pius XI in 1935. His head was stuck on a pole on London Bridge for one month afterward. A trophy to barbarity. He died a martyr. You see here the actual execution site of Thomas More, where he died a martyr along with others. Really to the indissolubility of marriage, to commemorate the tragic history and, in many cases, the martyrdom of those who, for the sake of their faith, country or ideals, ended their lives here. Here you see within the chapel, of uh, within the Tower of London, the, re the remains of the body of St. Thomas More, his head eventually being placed in another church, in an Anglican church, St. Dunstan's Anglican Church, Canterbury in England. As we look at these images, I wanted to say a short word as well about St. John Fisher. I'll be short on John Fisher. But I think it's really important we look at these two saints together in many ways. And please do have your questions ready, your comments. We really want to, you to participate in the discussion afterwards. John Fisher was born in Yorkshire, towards the north of England, 1469. So around the same time as Thomas More, he was a theologian, an academic. He held high positions. The University of Cambridge, he became the chancellor there for life. He also encouraged the study of Latin, Greek. He was a great academician and actually was the personal tutor of Henry VIII when Henry was a boy. He actually preached the funeral homily of Henry VIII's father, Henry VII. He was appointed as bishop of a small diocese called Rochester leading a life of extreme personal austerity. He is famous for placing a human skull on the table during his meals to remind himself of his eventual end. Many similar qualities to Thomas More, great learning, integrity, academic accomplishments. But here too we find that when King Henry wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine, John Fisher, became the most ardent supporter. He st openly stated in court that he would die for the indissolubility of marriage. And so he incurs the lasting wrath of his former pupil, Henry. It's just impressive that all the bishops of England, except Fisher and two others, simply lost their courage without a fight to Henry VIII's takeover of the Catholic Church in England. And that weakness in a specific moment, that's why it's so relevant today. I mean, uh, we'll talk about this later, 
But that weakness brought a crashing end to a thousand years of Catholicism in England. The faith, of course, endured in some form, but would never be the culture-forming force it had been for so many centuries. An embarrassment, really, that almost all the bishops of England fell, fell like dominoes, one after another, at the slight puff of the breath of King Henry VIII on their cheeks. Some things, it seems, never changes. So it is that, that John Fisher as well was imprisoned in the Tower of London. He was imprisoned, John Fisher, for over a year. And it's just interesting because around the, year, around the month, May 1535, he's appointed a cardinal by Rome whilst he's in prison. And the Pope wants to send the red hat to the tower. And you know what King Henry VIII said to the Pope? Don't waste your time. I'll simply send his head back to you. I'll send his head back to you. And so it is that his last moments, John Fisher, really people are amazed by his great courage. But I want to say a little bit uh, about what the relevance of these two men are for us today. And I hope this can really uh, spur some conversation for us now. The concrete situation we are living in today. These two men, John Fisher, Thomas More, not only understood the teaching of Jesus, they were great theologians, great academicians, lawyers, but they, they knew something else, that if Catholic Christianity was to survive, as it needs to survive today, it means swimming more and more against the tide. I'm just thinking in these days about the Supreme Court decision on discrimination just a few days ago. But here in Britain too, some of us know this, that just two days ago, the House of Lords voted by a huge majority, it was massive, almost two, three hundred, I believe, three hundred, I believe, to allow abortion in Northern Ireland until birth for children who are known to be disabled. It's just incredible. And we, we, something is really important in all of this. John Fisher, Tom Moore died because they believe that no secular royal power can replace an authority given by God to the Holy Father, the Bishop of Rome, and a teaching that is objective. There is a revelation. There are objective truths. I want to quote, and I'm nearly finishing, but I want to quote a little bit. You know Pope Benedict, when he came to Britain in, in the year 2010, he spoke in Westminster Hall. It was just so impressive because you had Pope Benedict before, I think, five British prime ministers, past prime ministers, the, the present prime minister. And he spoke about Thomas More. And he said this, by, by appeal to what authority can moral dilemmas be resolved? He spoke about an authority. He spoke about democracy. And he spoke about an authority. And he said something really important. He said that the Catholic tradition maintains that the objective norms, in other words, there are laws given to us by God that we do not make up according to the situation of the moment, but they are inscribed in revelation and they are accessible to our reason but they come from God's teaching to us in scripture, tradition, and in the magisterium of the church. And Pope Benedict said something very, very important when he came to Britain. He says, religion has a corrective role. It sheds the light of reason on current issues that are going on in our world today. I just want to uh, read a little bit, uh, you know, because down the ages, and especially in our own days, I think that many people are saying that the Catholic Church 
needs to accommodate itself to a secular world by embracing, even marrying, the spirit of the age. In some ways, we see this even creeping. I'm not saying creeping, but entering like a mighty storm sometimes into the Catholic Church. We have to accommodate the spirit of the age. And it leads really to a dangerous complicity. Uh, you know, Pope Benedict said that social consensus is really fragile, really fragile. And I want to just finish with some words of Pope Benedict the uh, 16th in Westminster Hall. He says this, I recall the figure of St. Thomas More, the great English scholar and statesman, admired by believers and non-believers alike for the integrity with which he followed his conscience. Remember today is the day of conscience today. Even at the cost of displeasing the sovereign, whose good servant he was, because he chose to serve God first. Listen carefully for the discussion now. The dilemma which faced more in these difficult times, the perennial question of the relationship between what is owed to Caesar and what is owed to God allows me the opportunity to reflect with you now on the proper place of religious belief within the political process. And Benedict XVI, in front of great leaders, prime ministers, said the central question at issue then is this. Where is the ethical foundation for political choices to be found. Where is the ethical foundation for political choices to be found? These were the last words of Thomas More, one of his last prayers, not the last words, which can help us. Glorious God, give me from henceforth the grace with little respect unto the world, so to set and fix firmly my heart upon thee, that I may say with thy blessed apostle St. Paul, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I long to be dissolved and to be with Christ. St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More, pray for us. Thank you, Father Tony. Um, could you lead us in prayer before we get into conversation uh, for the intercession for these two great saints in this time? Um, Thank you, Deb. Yes, I will. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we live in times which are really full of opportunities, graces, magnificent progress for which we are truly grateful, but also a time of unprecedented challenges, of so much uh, confusion and doubt, if, particularly in front of moral issues that are really changing the world for generations to come. Just as Thomas More and John Fisher had to take a stand, on one particular issue, they had the courage to do that. Give us courage now in our own lives that we may, with courage now, discuss, bring forward what we want to the table in order to really see where the Lord is leading us individually. Mother Teresa said, you know, that each one of us is a drop in the ocean. But without our drop, the ocean would not be the same. What contribution can I make to the concrete situation I am living in and faced with today? Send us your spirit. Give us faith. Enlighten us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Tony. Um, so I turn it over now to... Dr. Robert Moynihan, and to also to Father Tony to continue uh, as we lead it into discussion. 